cabaret last night was a joy. From, thank you very much. Well, I, I did work hard. I and I've been trying to sing, you know, I wanted to sing. Uh, I mean, I remember when I was a junior school, you know, I remember my, my uh, music teacher came up and said, you know, which instrument would you like to play? And I said, the triangle. And she sent me to Bermuda. <laughs> well, you know, that's what it's all about. And you've been extraordinary fans. There's been no rude people. Uh, nobody's been obnoxious. Nobody's caused trouble. And I don't know whether it's the size of the convention. Um, oh, excuse me, my job. God, I brought that up. Um, um, it's just been excellent, and I'm a bit forward, and I do talk a lot, and I imagine I annoy some of the other celebrities because I tend to like people getting involved with them, but, you know, I came out early because I've had such a good time, and it's lovely when you see the response. And that audience last night was the warmest and the biggest uh, that I personally have ever uh, appeared in front of, so uh, it was excellent. So you're all going to go home, what, later on today, most of you go today? And yeah, of course, you know, we get our rooms paid for, so we're all famous. We, can stay <laughs> we had a guy called Dick Turpin on yes. He used to hold stage coaches up in the 18th century. Never forget the time, well, I wasn't there myself, but he came up in front of this stage coach and he got his gun out and he said to the driver, he said, stand and deliver, he said. And he said, I'm going to rape all the men and rob all the women. And the coach driver said, excuse me, Mr. Turpin, I don't want you to tell you your job, but... Don't you mean you're going to rape all the women and rob all the men? And the little voice in the back of the carriage said, You be quiet, Mr. Turpin knows what he's doing. Um, isn't it lovely? I don't know what, I seem to like gay jokes, and I'm not even here. Um, so, yeah, so, and I suppose you're all going to say yes, but have you enjoyed the convention? Yeah? yeah. No, no real complaints, everything's been on time, and whatever. I must tell you that Jeremy Bentham is coming on to, uh, to, to take over this panel soon. That's if he can get the microphone out of my hand. <laughs> and um, he's got some more original slides, and so I'm giving myself a bit of a plug here. He's got me as a cyberman, which I think is a, a unique job. Yeah, I don't know. And, um, and me as a yeti, although I don't think I'm the... Uh, I think there's a group of yetis, and I'm not the one with the top off the yeti, but... Uh, the only reason, a lady asked me a story, I'm not sure just used the five minutes to tell you. One of the funny things that happened in the web of, uh, was it web of fear, yeah. There were six, I got the part as a monster because I was a big guy, like if you're six foot in England, not, there's not too many six foot, three guys in England. And when I got the part of the Yeti, there were six of us in this particular story. And the Yeti costumes, uh, like um, David Banks was trying to tell you about the size of the costumes, the Yetis were worse because they were four inch thick, they had three inches of fur, an inch of plastic, and then huge, like a, like a leather kind of leatherette interior. And once you were in this huge zip, they had to put a big piece of wire through the thing on the zip to pull the zip up. And you could feel your life sort of go away. And when the zip got to the top, you sort of thought, shit, I'm in here for an hour. And of course, you know, we all need to do wee wee's and big jobs. <laughs> That's if you can remember the code number. And um, I just love that too. And um, one of the guys, uh, when Douglas Canfield was directing this particular story, I became, and I know you're, I'm not saying this to get a laugh, but I became the Yeti spokesman. In other words, because I've always had the biggest mouth. I mean, Nick Courtney always said, well, why do I talk so much? And I don't know why. Because I was lonely as a child, I suppose. And um, anyway, one of the guys we weeded or wetted himself inside the Yeti. It's, no, it's just, I mean, it's not really crude or anything. It's just that, you know, he was in there for an hour and he wanted to go and he thought, oh, sorry, I'll do it in the Yeti. And we, we, you know, you've done it in the sea. I mean, you know, you're not going to walk two miles out of the sea when you're in there. You just stand there and make out you're looking at the sea and you just do it, don't you? And that moment of warmth down the inside of your leg is one of the biggest thrills you get in your whole life. Isn't it? Well, I mean, I know, I've done it. I and this guy weed in the Yeti uh, thing. Now, the thing was. My experience as a Yeti is this, when you can see each other face to face and you recognize each other by our names and faces, when you are all in a Yeti costume and you've moved around, you don't know that that's Tom and Stephen. They're just six Yetis walking around like this. Funny how they walk like this. I think it's because he wet himself and he was sort of like, you know. Anyway, the funny thing is we'd heard that he peed in this costume and the funny thing is the next morning when we got back on vacation, the other five of us were all there early <laughs> making sure we didn't get the costume with the piss in it. <laughs> and uh, hence the expression, when you see a Yeti, tell him to piss off. Now, now, oh sorry darling, you don't like language like this, do you? Right? Where have you been with your language? Have you ever heard words like that? Nobody in your family ever said piss or fucking? Right? Do worry me, people like you. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, so anyway, that was the story about the Yeti. And the only other thing we did, which was quite nice, is I, I wanted to see if they worked. I, it's just that it puts people off. If you see someone look at you with disgust, it makes you feel bad. And um, what we did is, when we got the Yeti costume on, I figured that they wouldn't be real if you couldn't frighten somebody. And we were in Covent Garden, it was 6.30 in the morning, I don't forget, there's a giant Yeti in there. And I said to this guy who was in the other costume, I said, shall we go out and frighten the dog? Like, you know, like, see if they really work. And it was true, we saw this mongrel coming up Covent Garden Road, and we jumped out from behind this wall, and went, like that. And this dog was just like a cartoon, his legs spun in the air, and he left a little message for us, which we needed to record. And uh, so that was my story, and that lady's made me want to get off stage now, so I shall leave this until later. Thank you, madam, for nothing, and the rest of you will see you later. Two unnervous breakdowns. <laughs> Honestly, I was a terrible child. 
And the video was awful, because I hated schooling. So all the prop men, when it was time for my three hours a day of schooling in Elm Street, they used to hide me. And these poor women couldn't find me. It was great. They were all on my side. I loved it. Well, I thought, well, I thought, oh, this is, I'm going to be really grown up here. I'm going to make up, and the man's going to make me up. And I was really looking forward to this, you know. The old star time, only nine years old. And I got in the chair. And he said, oh, yes, look at this all out of the cake round, my frock. I thought, well, oh, this is going to be good. Had the eyes and the lips and all that. All he did was paint freckles on me. <laughs> freckles all over my nose. I was most disappointed. Oh. But are we allowed years, what, 40 years, 30 years on to know who <laughs> had
Oh, sorry, I'll chat. And then you say, oh, that's okay, Pat, because he wasn't star, you know. And you know, do it again, and then you go, oh, shoot! Like, like, he had more body noises on the goal. And I hate to tell you what the fourth one was, but that's the one that put me on my throat. I was once asked out by a Yeti. I was. And like a fool, I said yes. And he said, all right, we'll have a nice meal. Etc. This guy. I was all happy. That would be sort of the place where he would dance as well. There was a lovely man, really smashing. Then, in between horses, he said, Shall we dance? Sorry. And I said, Yes. So I got up. Like that, I got onto the dance floor. And this man was six foot seven. <laughs> I only five foot. And I went, Fine. I'm ten out of gravity. And I went, Oh. Straight into his tummy button. I shall do that ever again. Yes, you really seem to be fated to appear with some of these very tall actors. If we look at here, Bernard Bresnan. That's Bernie, is it? Oh, yes. Oh, mm. Bernie. At the time he was fully made up, he was apparently well over seven foot in height. Oh, he was, he was. It's quite extraordinary. Yeah. Do you want to say that Bernard Bresnan was like a, a, a reasonably well known comedian? Oh, yes, he was. But that poor Bernie, those suits, they got so hot, and the glass and the eyepieces used to mist up terribly. And I remember one particular week that <coughs> did in the ice caves, and we were in the rehearsal room, but when we went to the studio to shoot it, Bernie had his costume on. And the scene was, he drags me into the ice caves because yet again Victoria has been captured. <laughs> And Bernie came up to me just before we took it, and he says, Here, yeah, what, Bernie? I said, what, Bernie? I can't see nothing. <laughs> he said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, I can't see. I'm all steamed up in here. <laughs> so I said, I'll tell you what we do. Don't drag me in. You push me in. And then, in between lines, I will say to you, Right. Right. <laughs> he said, OK. Let's have a go at it. So we did. The director said action, and he pushed me in front of him. And we were doing our lines, and I was screaming a lot of thoughts. And I was going, right, and he went right. Left, he went left. Right, he went right. Left, he went right. <laughs> he went straight through the side of the cave, demolished the whole thing. The whole thing ended up on top of us. <laughs> that one I remember very well. Some of the locations were nowhere near as glamorous as they pretended to be. I mean, I remember one that literally was supposed to be set in Australia, and he never went much further south than. Uh... We were in gravel pits. <laughs> we turned a lot to be gravel pits. That's right, we were in gravel pits. Did that slightly shatter the illusion of whatever research you've done looking at the series? And you know, I don't see that. No, I knew too much about the business by then. <laughs> so I didn't know, did this illusion me at all? Uh, no. Did you find it a very punishing schedule working at Doctor Who? Because a lot of people don't realise you were virtually working week in, week out. Well, well, we did it in one week, didn't we, John? We did. I did 47 that year. I, I know it was tough because you got home and you sort of thought, is that if this is show business, then maybe we shouldn't be in it. And then you know, it was about 47 that year. And sometimes we were filming on a Sunday then outside. So it, it was quite grueling, but because it was so enjoyable, it didn't really feel that grueling, did it? I, mean, I think Deb had, I mean, with Fraser Hines on the right? Fraser Hines is regarded as one of the nicest companions ever. Because mm. he, he's such a human being, I and mean, he's so wonderfully funny. He's just got married, by the way, for what it's worth. Yes, he has. That's that's married married. Oh. <laughs> Not to John, though. <laughs> I, I saw it in a fan letter that Fraser was married. Turning to John then, uh, talking about elaborate locations, I think one of the other things that goes to the job is you're expected to get up to the crack of dawn some days to shoot sequences. Thinking perhaps of this one. Oh gosh, do you know, I remember that as though it was yesterday because I was so proud to be a Doctor Who monster. That's all I remember. You know, my mother said I've been one since I was born and I figured this is the fruition of my life. And I remember Douglas Chamfield, who is the man that made men. I found out only two years ago that uh, Douglas had gone into Barry Letts, the producer of the series at the time, 
and so I've seen an extra called John Woods, and they're back to the changing of names again. And I'd like him to be in Doctor Who, and he planned that I should be Benton uh, nine months before I was. And it's interesting, and so much so that I was put down in Douglas's will as being one of his four Paul girls, which was a rather tra yeah, a traumatic experience actually carrying a coffin of one of your best friends. But yeah, there I am. I'm, I'm, I'm the one on the right, I believe. And um, I know that by the way I'm walking. And uh, it was exciting because in those days I was uh, quite opposite to what I am now. I'm not a fun mouthed uh, person that I'm right now. And I used to be very shy and very sort of quiet in those days. And I remember having the costume put on and all the people in London around St. Paul's Cathedral all crowded around to see because wherever Doctor Who went, uh, people were sure to follow. And crowds of people with expectant looks on their faces. And to be a celebrity is good and bad at the same time, meaning you do have the long lines, you have the unemployment, you have the uh, you know, consternation as to whether you can do the part or not. But I do remember that because it was a big event and it was in the newspapers, Doctor Who comes to St. Paul's Cathedral. And when you think that cathedral uh, survived the war, Every bomb that the Germans dropped on England uh, missed, they were, well, one of them hit, but it was, it was saved. And yeah, it was a magic moment, and we had to walk down these steps, and I remember setting up the camera, they set up the camera, and I thought, my God, I'm the front yeti. <laughs> and it was a magic thing. How do how they coordinate it, though? So it can't be too easy to hear when you're underneath about five inches of fiberglass. Well, I, I think we just, I just remember saying to the other guys, just walk seven, seven feet behind and just keep roughly in a straight line. I mean, the funny thing is, when you're a monster, you talk to each other out the side of your mouth. Like, we're just like Deborah said, you know, you're, you're like, you know, you're saying, okay, we're coming up to the steps. And like, if you're trying to do an alien kind of walk and talking as a human being at the same time, it creates quite a nice illusion. But yeah, I mean, I only remember it because it's like yesterday. I suppose on galactic time scale, it is only yesterday. Uh, but it comes 25 years, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Deborah, did you find any, any problems with the crowd control whenever you went on vacation for some of your series? Oh yes, I mean, because I was always following for Doctor Who, and wherever you went, they were sure to find out that you were there. So they had to be controlled, really. Quite honestly, we weren't screaming anything like that, they just wanted to watch. Because it's interesting, and I do. Great, lots of people love it. But uh, they had to be organised as well. But did you have to spend endless hours putting out autographs for well, that wasn't about us, loads no, of the no, no, that wasn't about at all, because we were there to work and get that film in the can in a certain number of hours, so we couldn't do that. There was an enormous urgency and a, and a lying, wasn't there? You could see the cat, the directors would really get tense if... Uh... The only other thing, if I may just say about the Cybermen, uh, when, uh, when the BBC do any filming, uh, they do use video now, of course, but when they used to use the good old 16mm films, Oh, we used to go out to Ealing, uh, which is just outside of London, what's in London, it's just outside of uh, Port Lane. And um, I remember, I've always had the, the, the desire, that because I was so excited being in show business then, although I wasn't acting, I was an extra, I remember walking out into Ealing High Road to make a phone call to my mother, and I ended up, the only time ever I ended up on the front page of an English newspaper, the Daily Mirror picked it up. And I was walking along, and I came out of the Ealing, the gates of the Ealing Film Studio, and I felt, oh God, I mean, I so, felt so excited. And I walked along, and there was a young guy, a kid about seven or eight years old, and he was carrying the, the, his shopping baskets from Sainsbury's, which is like, you, you know, one of our big supermarkets. And he, he hadn't seen me because of the line of trees. And as he's walking along, and I'm imagining it was on Friday afternoon, I think it was, and he was obviously just going to do the shopping. And he saw me, or saw the side of him, dressed, and his mouth, I mean, I've never seen a look on anybody's face. It was a mixture between horror and amazement, because they'd never seen a Cyberman before, certainly in Ealing High Street. And it had such an effect on it, I think. He went home and told his mum, his mum found out the BBC, and the Daily Mirror photographer came down and asked us if we'd reenacted. And I was almost on page, I was like, I've got 3,000 editions of that page. Oh, it was so exciting. Because the Radio Times used to follow quite closely the life and times of the companions of, of Dr. Blue in your era. At least two or three articles uh, previewing various news stories that are talking about A, what you were doing in your private life, and B, your business ventures. And did you mind that kind of business? Yeah, I don't really know. I don't know. It wasn't the Radio Times. They would have done well, they used, to, they used to preview each story uh, on a little quarter page before the Saturday. Oh, so I know what you mean. Yes, yes. No, I
works on the science fiction convention. Now, the press in Great Britain take, greater, take great glee in thinking that all science fiction fans walk around with goldfish bulbs in their head. We talk to this bit like that, because they're all psychomatic. <laughs> Can I ask you about both of your feelings on that first initial invitation? And did we live up to your expectations? Or live down to your expectations? Well, I, yeah, my first one was Chicago. And uh, I remember they, I got a phone call from Chicago. And I'd never been phoned from America before, certainly having the charge reversed, you know. And uh, no, it wasn't. And this guy, it was Norman Rubenstein. And he said, uh, are you John Levine? And I said, yes. He said, I'd like you to be a guest star at a convention in Chicago. I will pay your fare, I will give you a luxury hotel suite, and a certain fee, which was higher in those days because it was the beginning. Although you must remember that your American dollars are halved, and into English pounds. So let's say it was, let's say it was two thousand dollars. It's only a thousand. It's only a thousand pounds. And by the time you take your expenses and pay your agent, you don't end up with that much. But um, I couldn't believe it. And I said, but "Why?" I said, "Why would you want me to come?" He said, "Because you're famous over here." I said, "How can I be? I've never been there." And he said, "You know, I, I was quite a bright guy in those days." And um, I didn't have an agent at the time because I was in between agents. And I remember getting on the plane, and I actually remember the day I was on the plane. I had the first time I'd flown, that's a bit of interest. And I didn't want the guy next to me to know that I hadn't flown before. And I remember looking at him and saying, you know, I said, look at those people down there, they look just like ants. <laughs> and he said, they are ants, we haven't taken off yet. You know. <laughs> but uh, I arrived here, and of course we were picked up in a stretch limo, which nearly but my mind was having a stretch, and you know, the biggest car I'd seen was a Morris Minor. <laughs> and, um, and there I was, and, and the whole crowd of people, about a hundred people, and I thought, I mean, I did the usual thing, I looked round behind me. Well, I mean, I didn't know what, and I looked round, I thought, and, and it was all for me. Big, big little plug of black house was welcome, John and me, we love Sergeant Benton. I thought, who the hell are the Beatles, you know? And, you know and I arrived at this hotel, which is awfully big, and it was a, it was a Hyatt Regency, and uh, up the other one, up the other end of town, with that fabulous nightclub in it. And there it was, I went into this suite, and of course American food appeared to be different then, and everything you had over here was so big, I remember ordering a pizza, and I could have roofed my house with it. <laughs> I mean, I, I looked at it, and I was here, and I thought, you know, there must be another 50 people joining us, so, and everybody got one. And then, you know, and then you order a suite, and you get this huge, Huge, but I didn't know whether to dive in it or eat it. So that was my first experience. And then, of course, it hasn't stopped since. So now I'm in America, of course, I, I do get a lot of conventions because I'm cheap to fly. Sorry? Oh, um, uh, 83? 83. And I haven't. Yes, I think it's that big. Yeah, so I was, I was overall by it. What about you, Deborah? Well, my first convention was in Liverpool, the Moat House in Liverpool. A man called Graham Wood rang me up. He kept on ringing me saying, please come to one of our conventions. He went on to me for about four years, because I thought, I can't, I can't stand up on the stage and speak to people. Is this me? Going funny, no? I can't stand up on the stage and speak to people without a script or something. And I felt awful. I was very shy. And I thought, no, come on, Molly, you must do it. Get back and see these people and talk to people because you maybe I I know something that you know you don't and you want to find out what I know. So I pulled myself together and I went to Liverpool. I was awake all the night before. I was terrified. But half an hour into the convention, absolutely fine. Something happened. And I went, I like this. <laughs> I can get used to this. And it, it was marvelous. I've been doing them ever since. But I do remember at that particular convention, which I have never ever forgotten, I had to have an interview with the so, local newspapers. We were doing it in the foyer. And they had a Dalek going around reception, you know, as they do sometimes at these conventions. And there was a, a Yeti in one corner. Anyway, I was sitting on the sofa just doing the interview, and a family come into the hotel to register the parents and two children. They walk in, and they stop dead. 
and then you see the starlet rushing about. <laughs> and then I see the Yeti. And I don't quite know what's happening. And the children are saying, oh, what's going on? Like that. And the father says, well, I don't know. And the mother hasn't spoken. She drops her cases. Dum. She cannot move. She's like this. She starts to run to the lift. She wants to get away from this. I've never seen anyone so terrified in my life. The lift doors open, and out comes a Cyberman. <laughs> I, should, I should mention to the American audience up here that uh, this, year in, this year in Britain, uh, a big, very big megabucks uh, drama was screened called GBH, which I believe has just been sold to America by the Independent Television Corporation. It stars Michael Penn of Monty Python fame and an actor called Robert Lindsay, which Robert Lindsay plays the part of uh, a counsellor, funny enough, uh, is trying to get into power in Liverpool, only to find that everyone in the council is gradually trying to stitch him up and basically undermine his confidence. I won't ruin the whole plot for you, but if I tell you that by episode four, he's in a hotel in Liverpool, with a girl in his bedroom who's got no clothes on, his wife's looking for him, he's trying to find where these other counsellors are who are trying to do the nasty on him, and the hotel's been double booked with the Doctor Who convention. <laughs> and what Deborah's just described does happen. I just, just because uh, you like these stories, I just saw a very quick one, which I think really is my fondest story. When we were doing the demons in a, a lovely English village called Oldbourne uh, in Hampshire, and it's now become very important because the Cloven Hoof, uh, the, the, the pub we used in the demons, is still there. And uh, on the way back, John Pertry, as I said, took his doctor very seriously. And as I said, I always drove his car because I didn't have enough money to buy one. And I, I liked to drive. He liked to learn the script while I was driving. And we were driving back from Oldbourne, and the third episode of the story we had done just before the demons was being transmitted. And like in England, we didn't have video of things then, and we certainly don't get them repeated. And I'm driving down the M, M1 or M5, I've, I've forgotten my roads, and M3. And we're driving along, and John said to me, we were hoping to get home in London, I was going to stop off at his house and, and to see our show. And, and have a cup of tea, and then I was going to go the three miles to get back to my family. So we're driving down the M3, and John said, we're never going to make it to London, John. And I said, no, I said, damn it, we're going to miss the show. And John got quite, not edgy, but he got upset, and he said, I've got to see it, you know. So <laughs> we got off the M3 with about 15 minutes to go, and we pulled into a council estate, that's a, where you know, kind of government-subsidized houses. And he said, let's go and knock on a door and ask him if we can touch it. <laughs> And I swear, and we stopped, and I mean, one house was the same as, and I said to John, well, I'll do it, because I had actually a bit more front than John, because John was so noticeable. Now, you've got to remember, we still had our costumes on. John, John always had it, John always wore his cloak, it was quite cold, he had his cloak, and I always kept my military jacket on, because I like to take it home and polish my buttons. And uh, we knocked on his door, and this woman came to the door, and well, she did the same as the lady at the lift with the Yeti, and uh, the Simon. And she said, can I help you? Like, she, this is either a new, I mean, I don't know, what, 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 what must we look like? The, the doctor and Ben was down there, and John, very politely, in that wonderful voice of his, said, I do, I do apologize. We have just finished a location in the old one uh, at the end of the entry, and we wondered if we could watch uh, our episode of Talk to Who on your television. So they said, they kept their us in, and it was the strangest half an hour I've ever had in my life. There's, there's John and I watching the television like this, and there's the family of three kids in the back of the Watching us, it was amazing. Uh, to this day, I wish I could remember where it was, because I'd love to go back and see if they're alive, but to see these five people watching us, watching us. <laughs> what day is we here? Well, I must just start to wrap up this now by, I suppose it must be the most obvious question of all, but please, if you could let everyone know here what your future plans and engagements are likely to be, particularly for those who are likely to be happy to see you in the future. Right, Good. well, um, there's something happening at the BBC, which, when it comes off, I'm not going to say if, I'm going to be very positive and say when, it'll be very nice for me, it's a series, and I know I'm very, very close to it. 
and so we're pushing fingers to you for next January. And uh, I might be going, or I think I am going, on a Far East tour with the play called Here. The, the lead in a play called Wife Begins at 40. So, Wife Begins at 40. So I'm doing quite well. That's what I'm doing. Well, well, mine sounds a little bit silly, but I'll tell you anyway. Uh, because of these connections I've seen to be making in Hollywood, I'm going to produce this show with Mr. Wagner. Uh, I'm going to direct the uh, whole thing, and I'm going to do it. And then uh, a very big agent in uh, America and in Hollywood, uh, a woman named Henderson Hogan, uh, who uh, found and represented James Dean through the whole of his career. She's now 65, and she thinks I've got a nice future in Hollywood, and I'm here to make enough money uh, to move uh, to Mexico, as I said earlier on. And I want to build a very small uh, holiday place. I found a place on the Yucatan Peninsula, which is totally isolated and totally poverty-stricken too. And I want to build a place down there, and in my 55th year, I want to feed as many children as I can, and I've already copyrighted the idea of getting money from all these big, greedy hotels, which are springing up all over the place, just like this one. They charge the top money for the minimum stuff. And I'm going to try and turn the Yucatan around and get these kids fed. Well, ladies and gentlemen, sadly that just about wraps it up for the uh, panels of this weekend, or this three day weekend, really. We just have literally time for possibly two more questions. So if there's any that you've just been dying to ask. I think the lady in the pink was first. Yeah, I know, no, I'm sorry, I'm looking for something. I didn't see the You said at one point, excuse me, um, I'm trying to go to the room, the ladies. Do you mind? And I said, oh no, dear, it's all right, we're halfway through it. Well, Fraser was sitting there, and Pat was there, and at the time, I had a little kilt on, which had buckles, you know, at the side, at the, the waist. But what I didn't know, Fraser, during the first half of the reading, had undone every buckle on the skirt. And I got up to walk to the ladies, and I found my skirt on the floor. I was skirtless. I picked it up, and I hit Fraser around the head with it. Those are the ladies who to whoever sings. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that really is it for now, so... Okay, so quick, quick five-minute questions. Yeah, go in there. Well, they're trying to set it up, but you know, anything can happen in this business.